Thank you. Um, thanks for the introduction. Glad everybody can be here uh, it's the morning, bright and early in the US here on the West Coast. And uh, I'm sure you guys are from all around the world at this point. Um, so thanks to TraumaCAD for allowing me to talk to you today about the advanced measurement tools in TraumaCAD. Here's our agenda. Um, basically, we wanna cover uh, just the foundational elements of what TraumaCAD has to offer for total joint surgeons. In particular, we're talking about hip replacement planning today. Uh, we I'll just show an animation with implant templating just to cover that, uh, which is the core uh, function of the, of the tool. And then we're gonna then delve into uh, the fundamentals around the hip navigation, uh, cup version and leg length discrepancy, as well as the hip outcome tool, which uh, some surgeons, you know, may or may not be aware of or utilize on a regular basis. So first, implant templating. Uh, you can see uh, this is a right hip template. Uh, we have the king mark um, marker balls, which we'll again show a little bit later. Here, this is a, a templating that I'm doing for a patient uh using um stem and hip cup, cup constructs and here we're just navigating um using i think what many of you guys uh on the call would be familiar with is, is digitally overlaying uh templates for our hip implants uh assessing leg length discrepancy from this ap uh, view um and then adjusting implant positioning including femoral stem sizing, uh, acetabular component sizing, uh, inclination, uh, and planned leg length and offset changes uh, to uh, preoperatively plan our template. And then uh, I personally save these to our PAX service server and then uh, visualize these in the operating room and connect it to my um, RI HIP software. Um, there are other methods, including Quintry, that allow us to use this, this templated uh, image to take our plans into the operating theater. So pretty found, foundational and fundamental to uh, the function of TraumaCAD and something I use for all of my cases. The next thing and where the focus of this talk is, is on hip navigation and uh, the, the additional measurement tools. Um, and so I wanted to kind of delve into the concepts of what, why hip navigation is an added feature and why it's important. Uh, whenever we talk about total hip arthroplasty, uh, increasingly as we understand three-dimensional planes, we, we need to be specific to how we define inclination and version for our acetabular components in particular, and we need to understand what plane we're referencing to. Uh, historically, uh, in the total joint literature, uh, we've used a, more of an anterior pelvic plane, which is points through the ASIS and the pubic tubercle. Um, we're also aware that uh, there are additional planes, including the sagittal pelvic plane and axial pelvic plane. But for the purposes of discussion here, we have the anterior or anatomic pelvic plane through the ASIS and pubic tubercle, which is visualized here. And then we have a functional pelvic plane. And those functional pelvic planes may or may not be a parallel, um, that this is a plane perpendicular to the X-ray beam of the preoperative X-ray. Uh, and here we can visualize how that may be parallel or different. Um, as we have rotation of the pelvis around the ML axis, we can have an anterior um, pelvic tilt, which is in this case a negative number, or a posterior pelvic tilt, which in this case would be a positive number. And that results in a change in the relative inlet in terms of out anterior tilt or outlet that, um, in terms of posterior tilt view that we see. TraumaCAD is unique in that it can measure um, the pelvic tilt based on an AP radiograph. Uh, it's preferred over using the standard lateral radiograph from a workflow and radiation exposure, and it utilizes uh, a regression method uh, with gender-specific norms on a CT data set to generate the, tel the, the pelvic tilt from the AP image. So here I have a screenshot just of uh, the use of RI hip, and it shows on the left side our anatomic tilt and on the right side, the functional tilt, which are again referenced to the two planes 
that we um, that I covered earlier. And it does show in this case example a 13 degree negative or anterior tilt of that pelvis. So we'll go into more detail on a, a different case scenario um, to highlight this. How does uh, hip navigation planning start? So um, you'll need a, an AP supine image with the king mark. And then once the trauma CAD will recognize that you see that king mark image, which I'll show you a little bit more details about what the king mark is, but you can see these um, calibrated markers on this AP image. Once you do that, there are 12 total points, which the software guides you on selecting, uh, including the ones listed here on the crest, ASIS, et cetera. And then that will generate the tilt uh, number, uh, again, based on that data set uh, and ratios. And then it also has a magnification that, it, that the king mark uh, will help provide you with, just like a standard marker ball tools. Um, and then, you know, why do we want to use this? Again, I, I highlighted this uh, earlier, but essentially the changes in pelvic tilt change the axis um, that we work around. And so we want to be consistent and just defining where we're setting our inclination inversion and in what reference. We want to be able to target their uh, plane, their cup position based on the desired plane. So whether or not we want to target it relative to their functional supine plane, their functional standing plane, there's still a lot to be learned about how we improve total hip stability. And this allows this tool allows us to be very specific about which plane we're referencing um, and will facilitate literature and uh, research to help refine, again, improving for our patients Stability of total hip replacement because it's still uh, something we're always working on. Um, here's a, another visual example. This was a prior version of the RI hip software through Brain Lab, uh, and it shows uh, a navigated total hip acetabular component placed at 39 degrees of inclination and 20 degrees of anaversion. And the post-operative x-ray showed 40 and 7. And that was from differences in the, uh, the planes, which we've really emphasized here. So let's get into more of, uh, again, the specifics, returning back into how we measure this and show you an example. Here's that King Mark device, which I mentioned. So it's a, a plate that the patient lays on um, when getting the AP supine radiograph. And then we have this belt that runs across their body. And that's where those balls will align in parallel with the posterior markers to provide uh, the necessary information that feeds into the formula. And here's another example, again, of uh, how these change dynamically, not only from the operating room environment and the clinic environment, where you might have dis differences in the the, how you visualize the inlet, relative inlet or outlet view on the table versus when you were in the clinic, but also when the patients stand or are supine, we do see on the left, this is the same patient. They're supine, you see a relatively inlet view, and on the right, uh, as the patient is standing, um, you'll see a relative outlet view. And then down below, I do show flor fluoroscopic images, which depending whether you see an AP hip or an AP pelvis will change. Uh, your visualization of the by your eye of inclination inversion. So, I um, want to show again the a video of this. It's a relatively quick process. Um, again, the 12 points that I highlighted earlier, we have the pre templated image here from before. So, we've got our standard Im imaging uh, templates up here. And then now we're just highlighting the 12 points um, to provide navigation pl planning. Um, once you select the 12 points, there is a check to make sure that it's uh, feasible or that th th there's not any critical errors around rotation or uh, on the imaging. And then that will give you a green um, highlighted uh, result. And then um, at the end, I did add a measurement between the ASIS distances um, I did put uh, an inter-ASIS distance 
um, which there is uh, a secondary check on the patient, which we can do through um, some calibration tools. Um, and then I did send it to my PACs as I discussed before. So it's a really, as you saw, a very quick process. And then um, how we execute that, this is a little bit beyond the, the uh, scope of this talk, but here's uh, an example of placing our markers uh, on the femoral ray, pelvic array, you can see uh, those various tools which are executing the navigation plan to uh, validate the, the, the anatomic points and uh, execute the plan on placing the co component, acetabular component in the position that we want it to be relative to our plan. And here again, another example of our um, pelvic tilt changes. So on the left, we have a preoperative template. You can, we can go through here and see our anatomic measurements. Um, our hip navigation planning is completed. It's got a green go uh, indicator. Um, I've planned the, the cup at four degrees of in inclination. We've got our leg length discrepancy, our plan changes. I've measured the head. And so that's fed into information around the cup size. Lots of useful information for checking things throughout the case. The pre-op tilt is four degrees anterior or negative in this reference. And the, during the surgery, we placed the cup at uh, an inclination of 37 degrees and a version of 16 degrees relative to the functional plane. So just being very clear, the functional, not the anatomic plane. Then after surgery, uh, this is the same patient, again, done in my office with the same x-ray team, um, and we had a noticeable, I picked this case, this is not always the case, usually the tilts are closer, but I wanted to highlight another example where the, this patient had a 15 degree anterior tilt, so about 11 degree change from pre to post-operative, and the inclination then therefore looked at 43 degrees of inclination and 10 degrees of version. I don't have the one to reference from the operating room, but I just wanted to highlight, again, if you're trying to compare your numbers from before surgery to end surgery to after surgery, you need to have some way of, of um, correcting for these changes. And so this is a unique tool to be able to allow you to do that. We're all interested in um, not just using our eyes, but using, um, you know, a, a better method to assess our version and our leg length discrepancy. And so you do see on this implant planning, we do get a leg length discrepancy number, but oftentimes patients come into us and, you know, it's not relevant to plan the case. You just want to see after surgery what the leg length and version are for your patients. Like if someone's having recurrent instability, you want to understand uh, is this cup overly anaverted? Is this cup uh, overly inclined? Uh, they're having posterior dislocations. What's my plan for surgical revision? So here in this case, I'm using the AP and in my particular case, the standing x-ray, um, but supine with the king mark again is the validated method. And using the method to align to the ellipse of the acetabular component to determine the version. Again, on relative to the plane of the image. And so here we have a cup version that's 26 degrees, uh, leg length discrepancy number of one millimeters longer, and then an inclination angle of 48 degrees. So really fast tool. It's, you don't have to get a cross table lateral. You're not having to get a CT scan. It's you're getting uh, accurate information. Again, relative to the X-ray functional plane, you're getting inclination inversion numbers off of this tool. The next tool I wanted to highlight is a hip outcome tool. So these are all kind of, you know, navigation is a feeding into our execution of surgery. I would say version and leg length discrepancy tool is a more specific type of outcome tool. There's another element where data that we often want to pull and that's our center of rotation. We want to understand offsets. So if you really want to get into uh, more particulars about reconstructing the patient's hip anatomy and understanding uh, how we've restored or not restored offset. Very important for issue of femoral impingement concepts, uh, concepts re regarding revision surgery. 
and you know double checking what we're, how you're performing the surgery interoperatively and picking the right implants for your patients. So this is the hip outcome tool. You can see different points selected. I'll show you another animation of that. Um, and the, on the right shows you the, the values that you get. Like here's another example, again, showing us stem alignment. So here's the preoperative outcome tool that shows us before surgery or offset hip height, et cetera. And then here's our post-operative hip outcome tool, which then allows you to go back and compare um, here the, in the green, the leg lengths again are generated as well as your stem alignment, so your varus or valgus positioning of your stem component, the offset, center of rotation, how you've restored it, etc. I think one of the things also to be really aware of is making sure you don't get a rotated AP pelvis because it will distort the offset. But if you have a, a, a well done performed since uh, non rotated pelvis, um, where you have an oblique view, then you'll, these are really helpful to, to reviewing performance and uh, offset uh, values after surgery. And again, here is that uh, video of the post-operative hip outcome tool, which you can find under the measurements tab. So using the teardrops to establish um, our plane, the lesser trochanters um, and then the pubic tubercle, uh, and then using uh, points around the um, femoral head prosthesis and then the medial wall and then you're going to place points around the cortex of the bone as well as the stem of the implant in the post-operative hip outcome tool to generate your stem there for valgus positioning. So uh, hopefully this has been helpful. I wanted to highlight I think a few take-home messages. Um, I think templating is hopefully something that all of us surgeons are doing to make sure we execute plans and make sure we have the right uh, implants available for our patients to restore the pro their anatomy, their offsets, their length, etc. That's the way we execute surgery properly. And that's the core function, I think, of trauma CAD. But I think it's also very important that we uh, be able to look back at how we did and how we performed to continue to correct and improve our surgeries. And we also need to be able to look at um, other surger surgeries that were done elsewhere, review them, and from a workflow perspective, um, trying doing that all off an AP image is uh, a really powerful tool that we don't have to get additional imaging for. It's well validated and we can use these hip outcome tools to help really provide us with a ton of information uh, when using the software. Um, so I use it to facilitate interoperative execution, placing my acetabular and femoral components. Um, I use it with the RI hip software from Smith & Nephew, which is uh, a partner with Brain Lab. And then I'm able to use post-operative assessment to check my version, inclination, length change, and offset change. And I'm able to do that relative to the plane that I think is most important, my functional plane. And it's also able to correct for variations in x-rays that are done, uh, either fluoroscopic imaging in the operating room, post-operative uh, x-rays done in the, in the recovery room, uh, post-operative x-rays done in the clinic. So um, it helps eliminate the variability of technique and provide accurate information to track these values across those different environments. So that's the end of uh, my talk here. And so I'd like to just allow some time for question and answer. Happy to go through, review any slides that um, maybe I, I rushed through or concepts that I didn't explain well enough. Um, and I appreciate everyone's time. Thank you, Dr. Rothenberg. Uh, we do have a question here uh, from uh, Omar. Uh, he asks, uh, please, could you show how to measure pelvic tilt on trauma cut software, please? Uh, can this be done without King Mark or RI hip? Uh, so pelvic tilt, I did show how to measure the tilt um, using the hip navigation tool. Um, and that's the 12 points. Um, it, the software requires, in order for it to be um, 
to process pelvic tilt, it needs um, the king mark uh, on the image. Again, that's done in a supine radiograph, AP pelvis radiograph. And then the king mark it provides it with important information that then allows the software to run the tilt. So again, we're asking a lot out of a uh, AP image. And so we do need uh, a standardized tool to provide a posterior and anterior reference. And so that's how it's designed. So you do need a king mark generated image uh, or, uh, and um, the tilt values. At the present moment, the tilt values are generated through, um, run, are displayed on the software of the RI hip. Um, I don't know what might, if things might change there, but the pelvic tilt values um, are seen on the RI hip software. And maybe in the meantime, I can also ask a question. Hi, I'm, I'm Lutz. I'm the product manager of the Traumatil software. Um, Dr. Rosenberg, um, you, you showed this example where the pelvic tilt between the pre-op acquisition and the post-op acquisition were very different. So I was asking myself, how do I, how do I cope with such stark changes that, that we saw? I think it was more than, than 10 degrees of, of pelvic tilt. So what should I optimize for? Uh, I mean, when I prepare for surgery, the only information I have is, is the pre-op image. Um, so if the pelvic tilt post-operatively is so different, what should I, what should I optimize for? Um, I think that determining the right plane to target for is still controversial. And I've tried to highlight the importance at the beginning of how the, I think that the literature does a poor job around um, when we define studies of targeting version and inclination, being very clear about how the authors um, either, if they omitted thinking about the function, their plane, or if they did think about it, um, what plane they use, and then using the same language across the industry. So, um, you, you know, the various softwares that are available um, from this and other companies um, uh, that provide navigation can all have subtle differences in how they establish that plane that they reference the cut position on. And I think the probably the most important thing right now is just to be aware of what plane you're using and then to be consistent and to make very changes based on that plane. And then if you're um, going to the literature to maybe make a change to, as we look through instability on the hip spine sy syndrome and that interconnection has been highlighted, being very clear about understanding how um, the recommendations coming from thought leaders in this area can then be applied based on the plane that you're using. So um, that's a long answer of not giving you a discrete <laughs> way to do it. I, um, I think of you can define the functional pelvic plane as, you know, in your office, your team is going to get a very consistent x-ray with the patient in place on the on the bed so i think it's reasonable to say uh, that plane perpendicular to the x-ray beam in your ap office environment ap supine is a functional plane that you can target your version and inclination to and then when you go to the operating theater or the pacu or you know you um you're getting an early post-operative film or maybe the patient's uncomfortable and they're trying to find a different position. I think in that setting, you probably get more variability and technique um, of the x-ray beam. And so it changes the plane. So I think you're you want to correct back to um, recreating if you're the image that you had preoperatively. So if you're, if a, a, a different way of doing this would be doing an AP pelvis in the operating room fluoroscopically and making the image look like it did um, uh, in the preoperative state in the clinic. And then if you recreate that relative inlet or outlet view and the relative iliac oblique or obturator oblique view, so just making sure you're at a true AP, then you can 
you're basically then placing the cup visually along that same plane. So I, I think that the talk today was meant to not necessarily give 100% uh, the answers, but to sh show you that here, TraumaCAD provides the tools to allow you to be consistent and allows you to execute the plan and then also to make sure that that plan uh, went according to how you wanted it to go. Thank you. We have another question uh, from uh, Arun. Uh, how much accurate are the values from the software when compared to the actual values that you encounter while performing a surgical procedure? But in general, they're within a few degrees, um, one to two, um, uh, with a, a plus minus on inclination and version. Uh, so I think that's kind of the industry standard is to have them be within a few degrees. Um, uh, uh, on both of the inclination and version uh, metrics. Great. Uh, we have another question. Uh, do you find any limitations of generating an outcome based on 2D X-ray images compared to 3D reconstruction-based methods? Um, I think that um, I personally use the 2D reconstruction method, so I use this workflow for the vast majority of my cases. I, I do have access to a three-dimensional reconstruction method, um, which I use um, from a different manufacturer. Um, I find them to be equivalent in my mind. Um, I use that other three-dimensional software for uh, the additional information that I get regarding um, out case outliers. So the navigation planning subset is based on um, more routine hip replacements and um, for patients with uh, pertrusio or severe acetabular dysplasia or uh, prior post-traumatic osteoarthritis, I think a three-dimensional tool is valuable and probably starts to push this outside of the norm values you want. So I think you have to think about as a spectrum. If I've got a routine total hip replacement and I want a routine workflow with minimal radiation exposure and the least amount of invasiveness and time and cost, then I think this workflow is um, is excellent and quick, efficient, and gives you the details you need for the most most of patients. Um, if you have a complex case um, where those data sets are going to be strained to give you information, revision scenarios, et cetera, then a three-dimensional um, uh, software is going to give you, I think, more accuracy around the, the periphery of the margins of where this data set probably won't give you the same, the correct assumptions. I think it's also important to highlight that the reference plane there, you, um, you, some of the manufacturers still can't generate tilt from the pelvis um, from those images. Um, and so then they uh, still ask you to get a lateral film. Um, so you're getting you're getting some additional information on those 3D imaging, uh, but in some ways you're having to get the lateral X-rays um, to provide the tilt number, uh, which this 2D workflow can give you. Well, thanks for everyone's time today. And uh, yeah, if you have follow-up questions, uh, feel free to pass them on and try to give you answers.